I think everybody finds their own path, but there are certain tenets of health that feed the brain, that balance the brain. And also they're unique to you, right? You have to look at your history, your genetics. Mario Hemingway, thank you so much for coming on the Dr. Tina show. I am fangirling, to be honest with you. I'm very excited to have you here. We're going to talk about mental health and health in general, and I am excited to dig in with you. I'm excited because when I, I guess, stumbled across when you know how it came into this my circle of Instagram. But anyway, you came up and I was like, oh my God, like this is somebody who is speaking my language. And I love that. Because I also, when you bring up mental health, I think of mental health as really physical health, spiritual health, all of it. It all goes together. There's not one piece that's missing. Like if you if you don't have good mental health, you're not going to have good physical health. You don't have good physical health. You're not going to have good mental health. I mean, they're just in balance. They're in concert and all of it matters. And what I love about what you post is just, it's so basic. It's the basic tenets of like being human. What is it like to be human? You need to do these things that we've forgotten how to do. Like we've been on this planet for so many thousands of years and we don't know how to eat. <laughs> We don't drink water. We don't even know how to breathe. And that's the only thing that really is going to get us through, you know, get through anything. I mean, it just blows my mind. So there you have it. There's my spiel. I love it. No, I appreciate that. I, I really do. I try to make it so simple. I'm not there to, I'm not online to educate other influencers or other doctors. I'm not trying to speak their language. I'm just trying to help humans survive and navigate this because we had a big mess on our hands prior to COVID and now it's really, you know, exacerbated. So I'm just trying to hold the line there. And I appreciate, I was so excited when you I, for somebody messaged me and they're like, Oh my God, Mariel Hemingway follows you. And I was so excited. <laughs> so, well, I, I wanted to share something with you and I, I wanted to share it on the air and this is no way to like bring the mood down, but I have, <laughs> obviously I'm, I'm 48 years old. I've known about you for a long time. I was, you know, I, I grew up with you on, in the movies and on my television. Like I have always known who you were. I always thought you were so beautiful. I always thought your sister was so beautiful. And, um, when I was 15, I fell into a very dark depression. I tried to kill myself and I'm going to cry. <laughs> I, uh, I was so confused at what happened. Like, I didn't know what happened. I didn't know what had come over me. Some kind of darkness had come over me. And I, you know, this was back in what, 90, 1990, 91. And I remember I'm a researcher. That's what I do. When I'm confused, I go look for answers. And I remember trying to search out information around suicide so that I could understand better what had come over me. Like why in God's name did this, like, it was like that. I mean, it was like somebody flipped a switch on me. I didn't, it wasn't a long-term planning situation. And I came across you and your family and like the history of your family and what was, you know, what had gone on. And then I really took an interest in that because I was like, okay, this is not just something that plagues. I mean, like the common folks, like people who are famous, people who are, you know, I was a kid, I was a teenager. Yeah. So really just understanding and having like famous people, people who seemingly had all the things, you know, when you're 15, you look at movie stars and you're like, oh, beautiful model movie stars. They must have it all together. Right. And come to find out that there's struggles across the board. And I, I know now that we really talk about mental health, but back then nobody really did. It was a big stigma. I mean, it was a big stigma. And for somebody who was as articulate and supposedly talented and, um, you know, I was going places. I was the smart girl, you know, to be, to get hit with that. It was a big stigma. My whole school found out it was a big thing. So anyway, I share that because I have no, I didn't just know of you as like a famous, you know, model movie star. I also had some interest in that because you seem to be the one person in your family who thrived. And then all these years later to connect with you and see just through your Instagram, how you live and the health that you embrace. It, for me, that was very much the same thing was like, I, I realized at some point on this journey, like this body, this structure, this health house that I live in has everything to do with my mental state. So anyway, I just wanted to share that. Yeah. 
Well, that I thank you for sharing that. That's that's personal, and it takes courage to like dig in and figure out what your story is. But the good news is, is when you kind of do, especially you come along in life and you figure out what that story is. I'm a big believer. Like, figure out what your story is. Tell your story to somebody, and then realize it's just a story. It's part of the past, right? You don't have to go back there. And and that's the weird thing about suicide is that it is. 20 minutes of a bad day it's planned for 20 years it's it's complicated it is dis, it's deeply disturbing to those that you know that those that are left behind you don't know what has happened and if you thought about so i've had suicide suicidal ideation before um years ago and it's just it's this dark place that that at the time that you're going through it, you don't realize there there are solutions. That's a that's what's difficult about it is that, and especially if you're a teenager. I mean, you being so young at the time, you're like a teenager. Your whole high school found out whatever. But also, that is the most vulnerable time, and that's where I want to. Re I really want to make a difference in that world because they think that whatever problem is overcoming them now and you know break up this that and the other thing being bullied whatever it is feeling the pressure of being a an a student being the smart one you know like all these things and feeling all of that you actually think that that's that's life right that there's right. not a way Everything. out of that right you're just in that and you're screwed you know like you might as well just but the problem is especially with a teenager or somebody in their youth is they don't realize that energy shifts. Everything changes, everything, daily, hourly, you know, like all these things, we're always growing and shifting and do, but that's why you then need to find those solutions. And the solutions to me are lifestyle solutions. I mean, I know that some people need medication or whatever, but I do believe that taking responsibility for your mental health means taking responsibility for your life. What, how do you wake up in the morning? Do you drink water? Do you get sun? Do you, you know, like, do you exercise? Do you push and pull? And do you move your body in a way that, you know, activates hormones that should be in balance? And especially like with teenagers, they're, everything's out of whack, right? You're yep. like at the center of like, and, and that's when I was, I had the worst eating disorder. I was like, I thought I was controlling everything, but I was just, I was a nut. It was <laughs> when I was that age, I was like, I ate no fat. I was vegan, you know, like, and I was hungry. I was starving basically. And my brain was starving and I didn't realize that, right? You need fat. Your brain needs fat. I mean, your whole body does, but you know, not understanding that and that, and the, and it's kind of like the misinformation we get today. It's like, it, it's just, it's across the board. And I'm not a believer that everybody needs to eat a certain way. I'm probably very similar to you, but I think everybody finds their own path, but there are certain tenets of health that feed the brain, that balance the brain. And also they're unique to you, right? You have to look at your history, your genetics, your, where did you grow up? Did you grow up in a cold climate, a warm climate? You know, what's your blood type? It's all these different things. Um, and yeah, but that, that it's such a critical time that that time when you think that, oh, I should be done. <laughs> it's bizarre. And, it, and you make such a good point about nutrition. I was in the throes of anorexia at that time. And I oh, look wow. back, I look back on those years and I think, well, let's just put it this way. My daughter, who's now 22, um, hit a very sticky point at that age, same age. And so there, uh, you know, obviously some genetic component to just how our brains work. And I kept telling her, I was like, honey, if you would just let me pump you full of steak and fish oil and get you off these, whatever garbage she was consuming for food, the inflammatory foods, which are so much more inflammatory now than when we were younger. Um, right. I was like, we could just turn the page. <laughs> so, you know, so, so much. So, yeah. I, I see these young folks struggling and it hurts my heart. Cause I'm like, oh my God, if I could just control every aspect of what went in their mouth, if I could have a ranch and control every aspect, of what went in their mouths, monitor their exercise, yeah. 
put, take them outside for walks in the sun, give them some dogs to play with and some animals to see. Yes. Like, we wouldn't be in this pickle, but they don't want to make it that simple. You know, the, the pharmaceutical complex wants to make it, oh, well, you need these pills. And I'm not, again, I'm also, I'm with you. I, antidepressants have saved my life more than once in a pinch, but they're not the long-term solution. And no. you're absolutely right on the fat part. I was on a, it, you know, it was the eighties. What did we do? We yes. starved ourselves of fat, which was crazy. Yes. I, went, I wonder oh, how many I know. Lives- Everything was no fat, no sugar. I mean, the no sugar thing was good, but it was like, I ate bowls of popcorn and I kid you not, they were this big and I was starving. I would like eat bowls of popcorn and I would burn it. Here's the other crazy sick thing. I would burn it probably to give it some sort of texture because it didn't have anything on it. Right. So it needed something to be like, it was so, I just think back and then I would get, and then I'd go from popcorn and then I'd eat just like nothing, but I would overeat and then under eat and then fast. And I mean, it was crazy and it's so sad. And those are the times and that's when teenagers do all that crap. Right. And I say teenagers, it went on far too long. I was well into being a woman with kids. But, you know, the great news is I listened to my body when I was pregnant and I was so healthy when I was pregnant. Like I did all the, like all of it fell away. I just, I ate meat. I did this. I did that. And then the minute I had the baby, I went back to (laughs) being crazy. But, you know, that's, you live and learn, but it's like you, I just want to share with people. It's like, look, it's not that difficult my significant other and I are working with a couple they're getting married and they want help to like eat differently and change their life. super smart right intellects but it's so hard for them at first they're starting to shift especially the young woman but she, it's so hard for her she just she has eaten such junk for so long and she called me a couple of hours ago and she said you know, I feel the symptoms of a cold, you know, like I feel like I've got a cold. And I said, that's, you know, that's many years. It took you that long to do this. So you're going to have a week long detox. You're going to detox. It may be a cold, but you're more than likely, you're just getting rid of some stuff that is lodged in all the cells of of your system. It might be frustrating now, but you're going to feel so much better. But this is a person who's like, like finally giving up soda. I mean, like, wow along. I don't know how I did. I don't know how I lived so many years feeling like that. I felt terrible all the time. And I, I don't want to go back to it now that I feel better. It's a process though. You know, when I got together with my husband, he, this, what we just, we met in 2019. So he was already 47 and I was 46 and, you know, we're set in our ways. And it was really hard to find somebody age appropriate who was decently, burst on this stuff. You know, he's a, he's a farm boy. So at least he had that farm, you know, the, for the first 13 years of his life, he only ate food that they produced on the farm, unless he went to like a sports of, you know, like a sporting camp or something and they ate pizza or whatever. So he, he was easy to train. I, you know, I, I air quote that because I had to, there was some training involved. Um, but (laughs) it still took about nine months, I would say to like deliver the small bits of bad news. It was like, Hey, you know, those seed oils you keep eating. Those are, this is actually what they're doing to your cells or like, Hey, those, you know, whatever this, he loved to live off beans. I had to explain lectins to him. It's like a slow process and, you know, but he was trainable. And I think that's, he was coachable. I I think that's what it comes down to. If folks are open and coachable, it might take a while. And there's, we got to tiptoe them into this information because it's devastating when you kind of red pill somebody hard. Bobby's the kind that he would say to your husband, look, if you don't do this, I'll tie you to a tree and just give you water. And then, you know, like I'll come back in a week and you'll, you know, you'll be detox and everything will be fine. Then you'll just do the right thing. I'm much more like, you know, there's the mother in me is like, look, if you want to change your food, change your breakfast. Of course, now I don't eat breakfast because I intermittent fast, but whatever, you know, breakfast can be lunch. Um, But change that first meal and just see how you feel, right? Just, just start slow. You know, like I, I, I help people to get a meditation practice. I don't say start with an hour or even a half hour, start with five minutes. Like if you can sit still, for five minutes, be sort of aware of your breath, 
Yay, good on you. That was that that's a good start. And add a minute or two a day. You know, change and keep making different choices. And that's the thing. It's like people are people don't feel they have a choice. That's what's weird. The whole technical world and you know, the information that we're being you know, inundated with is is messed up. And if you're not in tune with somebody like you or, you know, you get only that information, you don't get the other stuff, I guess, because I think like you, I'm like, oh my God, people drink soda. Oh my gosh, people eat processed foods. Oh my God, but they do. And it's because they're being fed that all the time, mentally, they're getting that in this intellectual bubble that is like over their head, making them make these decisions. So they feel as though, they've been minimalized in that way that they feel that there is no choice. And people that without means say, oh, it's expensive. It's expensive to eat well. Yeah, well, it's far more expensive to get sick. So, you know, and how many times do you go to Starbucks and get a chocolate, macaque, <laughs> what is that? Oh my gosh. <laughs> if people knew what was in those, they wouldn't drink them. Yeah. Oh, no, I'm with you. I agree. Whole, I was thinking about this the other day in the shower. I've always told patients this and I, you know, when you're working one-on-one -on -one with somebody, it's easier, but if I can get someone's instincts to turn on, they generally make the right decisions, but to get those instincts to turn on, I'm kind of with your partner, like strapping them to a tree with only water for a week to get the crud out. My, it, the reason I was thinking of this is because my husband ate something out of the house, outside of the house. We pretty much cook everything at home at this point. He ate something on the job site and he said, all I could taste was chemicals. And I've never been able to taste the chemicals in the past until you got me off all that, you know, until it was out of the system. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, that's a big one. Right. But if people can get their instincts on, they naturally radiate to the things that make sense. But as you say, all oh, this technology, if they're watching television at night and watching regular, I mean, I rarely turn on regular conventional television. I know. And when I see the commercials, I'm like, no wonder everybody's so screwed up. Like this is insane programming that people are constantly subjected to. And, and, you know, like, and also I, I often look at the people that are giving that information. They look so unhealthy and you're like, you're telling, hmm, you, no, wait, how old are you? <laughs> wait, you're my age. You look 180. Like, I can't listen to you. You're like, God, like there's. And, and I don't mean that in a judgmental may, way. I mean that in like, you're so clouded with toxicity that I can see it radiating off mm -hmm. you. And, and you're giving me information trying to tell me about my own well-being and health. So I think that we do have to, you do have to turn people's instincts on, right? You have to believe that you know what's right for you. And that's kind of my thing. It's like, I really believe that everybody out there is their best doctor, right? You just have to trust yourself. It doesn't mean we don't need help. It doesn't mean that, you know, somebody doesn't go see you and say, look, I need to be guided because we need direction. Like, I'm not, I don't know. I have all the answers for everything, but I'm pretty darn happy with the results I get in myself. Like, I know that I work for me, right? Bobby doesn't eat exactly like me or do exactly like I do, but we're in the same ballpark, right? We do the same ish things, right? Because we, and we, and it, we feel amazing. Like to wake up and to feel amazing. You said something, I felt so sick. I didn't realize, I met Bobby and I did something called brain state technology. It was brainwave. Anyway, it was, you heard your brain in real time and your brain corrected itself. It's not neurotherapy, which trains the brain, which I've done, which is also amazing, but it's actually activating your brain's response to doing the right thing. Because if it hears the wrong thing, it'll go, oh, wait, that's not right. I need to correct this, right? So I did hundreds, <laughs> hundreds of sessions. Because I was really like, when I first met Bobby, he was like, you touch me all the time. Do you think I'm gonna go away? And I'm like, oh, uh, maybe. <laughs> Are you going to go away? Are you going to leave? Ah! And crying all the time. Like I was a mess. And then I did all this, all this brain state and I be, it basically balanced my brain. And I woke up one day and I looked at him and I go, oh my God, 
I think this is like the fifth day in the row that I just wake up and I feel good. And he's like, yeah, you're supposed to feel good. And I realized in that moment that I had been depressed every day of my life and I didn't even know it. Wow. I just was existing. I was like getting through, like I, I had the will and the strength and I was, you know, and I was determined I wasn't going to end up like my family, but it was like this, it was survival. And then I learned how to thrive. And that's been an amazing adventure for me because it's like, when you start to balance everything, when you start to eat well, when you start doing these things and connecting in nature and doing the right things for you, like, it's just amazing what you discover and how useful you feel every day. Cause I'm 60 and I've never felt better in my life, never felt better in my life. Like my life is so, I feel like I'm at the beginning of it. And I have to remind myself, I've got like, I'm going to be a grandmother and uh, you know, like I've got all these weird things happening, but I'm super excited about that. But I feel like this is the beginning of my life is what I'm trying to say. Like, I don't think, Oh, I'm in the senior years of my life. That's another thing. We're just, we so like diminish our senior citizens who really should be, you know, they're the wisdom keepers, right? They're the people that we go, oh my God, you have stories from our past when there wasn't technology. You have things, you have things to share. And that's what I, it really annoys me that because like Bobby's parents, my parents aren't alive anymore, but Bobby's parents are alive and they watch television all the time it's on constantly you know the news the this the that and they're inundated with that and senior citizens are being attacked they get they get the phone calls from those people that are like you know you better be careful because somebody's coming you know they're all bullshit calls but they don't know but it, it hurts me that we diminish that piece of our society when every other culture prior to now really honored the wisdom of, of the elderly. And we should, we need to get back to where that's important again. I don't know. There needs to be balance, but it's all. It's all I agree. I agree know, with you so, so much. I talk about that often. I think that we've, as we age, uh, this was a big thing at the beginning of COVID people kept saying, well, what are the elderly supposed to do? And I'm like the same advice I'm giving everyone else. It's not like they're stuck there. It's harder and they're not in such a regenerative capacity as a younger person, but that's, they're not stuck there. Most 60 year olds look like hell. Most people my age look like hell at this point. I didn't even go to my reunion. Cause I, it was like, I didn't need to walk into a room and be like, oh, how's your diabetes going? You know, like I didn't, and, and not to be disrespectful, but I just didn't need to see that. It's like, how's your alcoholism and diabetes going for you? It's, and we, in our current modern society, we just act like, you know, once you're 40, it's over or once you're 50, it's over or whatever. And it's, I mean, shoot, I hope to look as good as you and as healthy and vital as you at 60 and have my brain working as well and have my physicality about me and my libido, because without that, like I might as well just curl up and die. And we also are severely malnourished. So I think we end up with these yes. long standing malnourished folks. And as they age, I mean, if I could, I joke with my mom, I'm like, I swear, if I could just give all the folks in the old folks homes, B12 shots and thyroid and protein, <laughs> like we have so much dementia, but we really, we dismiss them. We discount them. I think it stems though, from a society that doesn't even honor history anymore. You know, we don't, yeah. even, we don't even know our it's, history, but yeah, I, I'm with you on the old, older folks. I think they well, are. And how about all those diseases never existed until you know, what, maybe 50 years, maybe 50 years ago. I mean, I, I'm not saying that, you know, dementia hasn't always been it or senility, but it is involved in the way that we live our lives. Alcohol is such a dark flipping thing. I yes. grew up in an alcoholic home and, you know, it's just so brutal. <laughs> I mean, it really is. And it's sad because it's legal, it's legal and it's like, and it's, it's celebrated. And I'm not like, oh, you should never, like, I don't care what people do. I really don't. It's not a judgment. It's just like, please be mindful. Please be moderate. Please look at what it's doing to your cells and your body. And if you really do want to be healthy and happy, you need to make better choices for yourself. I don't know. It's just, it's, it, it's very difficult because it sounds like you're saying, 
you're passing judgment, but it's not judgment. It's just the truth. These are the facts. This is what happens to your body. This is what happens to your brain when you don't take care of it. Yeah. I've watched people up here that were, you know, great athletes or whatever, but there was always that, like they drank so much all those years. And now those diseases that take you down from not really doing it all. It doesn't mean like if you're, a, you can be healthy, you know, yep. you can start lifting heavy weight, even if you're 70, Yep. like you go slow, you don't start with super heavy weight should be a little bit heavy for you. And then you work your way up because those things make a difference. And I talk about these physical things because the physical affects the brain. I mean, all of it affects the brain. It's a so thousand percent. Huge. That's yeah. I quit drinking in January. I realized I had slow dripped alcohol into my system constantly since I was 14. I never was a heavy drinker, but I was a very consistent drinker. I was like, this is not serving me or my brain. And I just thought of this while you were talking, speaking of suicidal ideation, I, you know, I I've had a, as many of us have, we kind of know what's coming next. Right. And it's hard to sit back and watch it unfold when you kind of already know what's going to happen and the senselessness of it, you know, and the loss and I was getting really depressed about this time last year, I was really depressed and I was having a lot of suicidal ideation, to be honest, if I'm, if I'm being frank and when I quit drinking, it completely went away. And I've had, wow. it's so weird. Cause ever since I tried as a teenager, I've had this little, I call it my little dark dragon. Like it'll creep up on me every once in a while and be like, you know what, right. this, is a, this is a good idea. It's not that I'm even noticing that I'm depressed or I might not even be in a depressive episode. I just get this little like whispering in my ear, like the little devil on your shoulder. Like you should kill yourself. That's a good idea. And I'll be like, Oh, okay. And I, I get, it comes out of nowhere, left field sometimes. And I, since I have quit drinking, I haven't heard it once. And I've been hearing it my whole life that I've been consuming. Wow. So that's so interesting. I've never drank because I was just too afraid of it. But, but it's interesting because when you think, you know, it's called spirits. And when you break that down, it's like, oh, you've, and you open your, your kind of your energy field to spirits, yep. right? You're vulnerable, you're open, and who knows what you've taken on. I mean, that sounds so woo woo. Sounds like I'm from California. No, I'm oh, from no. Idaho. <laughs> <laughs> I have a psychic Idaho. that I work with. It's okay. She clears me. She clears the, they like to latch onto me. I'm like a beacon for the darkness. So I, I get them all over me all the time. And I'm like, get off me. <laughs> Flower essences, oh, yeah. crystals everywhere. I'm like literally <laughs> sitting here with <laughs> rocks. Okay. 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 I got it. Me too. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a naturopathic doctor. I'm into the woo. It's good. <laughs> well, that, good. Let's right. talk about that because that's part of it, right? Like spirituality, more than just having a religion that you follow. I think spirituality is a huge part of mental wellness and, or just health in general and having, whether it's a belief in something higher or it's a, an ability to communicate with something bigger than ourselves. Like what do you, what are some of your practices and what are your thoughts on that? Um, well, I, I've always been a big believe. I, I've always been a meditator. I've always believed in God. I just, even when I was little, my mother had cancer when I was growing up and, you know, all the alcoholism. And I remember praying as a little girl, like it wasn't a religious thing. It wasn't like go to church because we only went twice a year. I like Christmas and Easter, but God was really important. And, God, and I always felt God here. And I grew up here in Idaho. And I always felt it outside. I always felt like, so I realized very early on that, that I was a pantheist, that like God was in the grass and the trees and the rivers and the mountains. And like, it just meant so much to me and it fills me up. I believe in, I don't know, I think it would be sad to not believe in something bigger than ourselves. Like, you know, what a lonely place that would be. I mean, it's a very small planet. We can't be the only life. But I do believe in God. And I do believe, you know, I believe in Christ consciousness. I believe that there have been great and wonderful teachers that have passed in, in the centuries before that, that are here to give, you know, to still teach us, you know, from a different, from a different level. I was really sad in the last year losing to Han because I've always been, I've been a, he's been a big favorite of mine, just 
felt so amazing. I got to meet his holiness a couple of times in my life. And it's just, it's very special to be around human beings that have kind of transcended that kind of base level of living life on this, in this, in this plane of believing everything that you hear, you know, and I think that's what believing in something greater than yourself does for you. It opens you up to the ability to just like be free of the thoughts that want to keep you small. You know, we're much bigger and more powerful than we realize, right? We're all connected. Like, I mean, the reason why we connected is because we're connected. Of course we did. And, the, and we have there's a vibration that's very similar and that's what happens in the world. Bobby likes to talk about the 99% space. So we're all made up of 99% space, which is an interconnected. It's all the senses and the senses we don't even know they're beyond taste, touch, feel, smell. It's beyond all that sight. It's like an un, it's an energetic thing. And we, and yet we focus on this point I don't know, points zero 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 one percent of us that is really such a minute part of ourselves, ego and all this stuff. And we put we hold on to that like it's everything. And it's one percent of us. The 99% is that everybody who's listening right now, yes, yay, we're all like sisters and brothers, and we're all part of each other. You know, it's very cool. I think so too. And I think you mentioned nature. I mean, it's, to me, it's all one thing. It's yeah. all, it's all one thing. And it's all, if left to its own devices, if left alone, it's all symbiotic. And it's been yeah. so weird to watch humans fight plexiglass and stickers on the floor and masks and fear and all of it. It's just like, you can, like, I just want to be like, I just want to shake people and be like, you guys don't get it. Like we live if, if left alone, we would be in symbiosis with this virus by now. I mean, whether you believe in viruses or not, or whatever, whatever it is, but like yeah. we, this would have chilled <laughs> this, we would be in harmony in nature with this by now. And yet we're not because as humans, we were so egotistical to assume that we could somehow we busted natural order is my opinion of this. And we've somehow assumed erroneously that we could control mother nature somehow. And it's all been very odd to watch. And so it's fun to connect with people like you who get it because it's like, it's all one thing, right? I know I eat animal flesh, but I am grateful for it. And it's not just some, I don't just like, it's not like a secondary thought. You know, my dogs are super important to me. I know your dogs are super important to you as well. And I talk to my dogs and when people <laughs> think I'm crazy. I'm like, well, I'm sorry. You can't communicate with animals. That's not my problem. <laughs> like, I'm, so <laughs> I'm sorry. You, I didn't, they didn't take the time to listen as kids, I guess, you know, so exactly. I don't know. I mean, well, I, I it's, know. and it's also about making those choices in a humane way. I'm sure you're not going out to Albertsons or, or, you know, to your safe way and getting the hormone induced, you know, whatever meat. And you know what I mean? It's like making choices that are sustainable and humane and kind as possible. I mean, yeah, Cal didn't have a good, but you know, like at least he was out on a range, you know, and oh, yeah. that's where Bobby and I kind of, we, we eat Buffalo and we eat, we eat meat. He eats a lot more meat than I do. I don't seem to need as much of it, but it's, we try to be really mindful of where we get it, you know, and that's huge. And you make those choices and that's a sustainable and honorable way we're part of a food chain, you know, to a certain degree. And I have friends that are vegans and they come out, you know, I love them and no judgment there. If you're healthy and you're happy, God bless you. I think it's great. Mm -hmm. You know, honestly, yeah. I really, really do. If you're I, really, if that's really sustaining your ability to have energy and growth, then it's great. And I do know a few that really are successful in that area. So I, and I was vegan for 20 years and I really, and it was very hard for me to give that up because I, I put a lot of like, it was like a, I thought it was so much better than, else. you know, like, I don't know. And I also didn't want to eat animals, you know, like I was like, Oh, but then when I realized that I was brought up 
I was brought up eating that way and I needed to honor that in my own body. That's how my body functions best. It just changed me. My eating disorder was like gone when I started eating more balanced. Yes. And I just talk about it, just eat real food. Like, yes. please don't eat like processed, you know, like if you're going to have sugar, have it once in a while. I mean, I don't because I'm too addictive. So I have to stay away from anything that's going to be like bread, loaf, you know, like <laughs> yes. cake, whole cake. <laughs> like I just don't do those things. Although probably it's been so long now, I wouldn't want, you know, like a wooden, but I have no judgment on anything that anybody wants to do as long as they can be mindful and moderate and do it, do real, you know, like just don't eat processed crap. I think having some control over your appetite, I don't think that anorexia served me in any way, except for the fact that it did teach me to have control over my appetite. And I do think there's something too that's helpful because I can look at food and make a better decision than just mindlessly shoving it in. And I mean, if it, that's the only upside I can think of, but yeah, I agree with you too. I've seen, I have never seen a vegan's lab results look good, but maybe they wouldn't have been in my office if they were doing good. Right. So they were there cause they didn't feel right. good. So it wasn't serving right. them. And I don't lay judgment. People always want to know what I eat. And I try to share that online and they get r really hostile. And I'm like, I don't care what you eat. Like I, I literally don't sit around concerning myself at all with how other people are eating. <laughs> I don't, it doesn't bother me. I don't drive past McDonald's and see the long lines around the drive through and think what what a terrible person that is. I don't judge. I'm just like, this sucks for you. This isn't going to go well if this is a normal habit for you. But you know, like you said, don't be in all the time or just I'm with you. I don't bring it in the house if it's a problem. And I admit I am a carb addict. So, and it made me crazy. It made me really crazy. And two got over my eating disorders when I started eating just real food and a lot more protein in my case, suddenly I was like, Oh, yeah. This is like nourishment, what a concept, like in the body. No, the I know. And then you don't nourished. have that desire. You don't even have that desire to eat all the carbs, you know, right? When you're getting, it's crazy because I was the same way. And also when I gave up grain, that was huge, like huge. Now I can have it once in a while. And it's not a big deal. I don't really, I mean, Bobby can eat, like he could probably eat shoes and be the healthiest person. <laughs> He's just that guy. Yeah, he's just that guy. He's like, did you just eat shoes and you're okay? Anyway, but he actually needs carbs. Like yeah. He works out. Yeah, some people do. Some people need that balance, right? Yeah. I need carbs in like a bit of fruit and stuff like that. I need that. I think that helps my brain a little bit, but boy, not grain. I'm happy to be, I've been off that for years and years now, probably 20 years off that. Like I don't eat grain at all. And it just serves me, right? It just serves me. It's so interesting. I think it has a lot to do with our brains. I mean, I just had a woman ask me about her young daughter and to her daughter's a teenager and her psychologist is telling her that her OCD is 90% genetic. And I'm like, I would never in a million years assume that it's 90% genetic. I would guess that your, her brain is probably wired in a way, but we have neuroplasticity. We can change yes. the way our brains are wired. So I would say what my advice to her was, it's much more likely that it's neuroinflammation that's driving the chronic OCD, but propensity towards neuroinflammation, of course, is going to have some genetic component. Anyway, yes. all this to say, we seek out the foods when we're not listening to our instincts, we seek out the foods that give us those hits and grains are a big one that yes, will really potentiate that mess because we want them, we seek them. It's going to give us that serotonin. It's going to give us what we think we need in that short hit, but man, the long-term repercussions in some people's bodies is I'm also not good on grains at all. And it can just wreak havoc in the brain in an inflammatory way. So good on you for staying away from it. But you know, you tell someone to consider giving up grains and they look at you like you have two heads, you know, what do you oh, say I to know. people? How do you address that? Cause people look at me like I'm nuts when I'm like, oh yeah, I don't eat grains. They're like, what, what do you eat? I know. They, it's like, what do you, that's always what you get. What do you eat? What do you eat? <laughs> what, what's left? And I'm like, oh my God, food is amazing. I think food is amazing. So I think we love food. We love to cook. Bobby's a brilliant, he like, he does the kind of 
like he does sauces and I don't mean like cream sauce, but he does like, he makes things really tasty. He can do that. And I, we love kind of, I make salads and things and, you know, we grill meats and stuff like that. But I think good food is the most healthy taste. I mean, I think it tastes better than like crappy food. I always think that like big sauced up crap that would like breaded weird stuff. You're like, what are you trying to hide? (laughs) What's under that? (laughs) Especially if your, if your taste buds aren't, most people's taste buds are all, well, and there's the other piece of this is not only are their taste buds acclimated to processed foods and hijacked, their brains are hijacked with these low grade doses of chemicals they can put in without telling you what's in there, but they're nutrient deficient and that nutrient deficiency turns down your taste buds. So if you're zinc deficient, I mean, a lot of us young women, I'm betting you were as well. You were probably very zinc deficient as a young girl. Oh yes. And that drives the eating disorders and you can't taste yes. this thing when you're zinc deficient and it makes you crazy and anxious and have no appetite. So it's like, we're looking right. at a lot of people who are just, again, going back to that malnourishment. I say this because I see pictures of you and I'm like, God, she's so beautiful and healthy and she looks nourished. Right. And like, I'm always, I came from such a depraved, I was just, I deprived myself of so much nutrition for so long. And now I finally feel nourished and in in so many ways, not just, not just my food, but spiritually and in my relationships and my work. But I see a lot of people, they're overweight and malnourished or they're super underweight not so much anymore and malnourished. And I think that malnourishment is driving a psychosis and a fear and just all kinds of problems that we're seeing in the world. 100%, 100%. And it's just like you said, it's like, but you can't take one of those keys out and say it'll work. It's gotta be like, you know, cause when you talk about neuroinflammation, I think about grounding. I think about walking barefoot. I think about, I have a grounding mat on, you know, under my bed. I, I, earthing's a big part of it, getting rid of neuroinflammation and body inflammation, that's key to just solving the brain's problems. I mean, or at least getting towards it, you know, because instant, you can instantly change inflammation by get, getting grounded. It's crazy. Like to just go out. To, I had a friend actually who lives in Portland and I saw this Instagram post. It was a few years ago was in the middle of COVID or something. And he posts, he posted this really sad, like, I mean, I think he was crying and it was a story. And I was like, holy shit. I called him right away. I was like, what is going on? He's like, I'm sort of, you know, like it was one of those. And I said, look, I'm not a doctor and I don't claim to be, please just, but listen to me, just do these things, go outside. I don't care if it's raining out there, go outside, take your shoes off. Even if you're on a sidewalk, at least if, it, if it's cement, if it's wet, that's great. It, it will, you will get grounded. There's the electromagnetic field can come through the cement. I said, if there's a bit of sunshine, God, God bless you. I know it doesn't, <laughs> you don't get a lot of <laughs> We sun don't there. get that here. <laughs> I said, at le- if you do get it. anyway, he was very lucky. There was like, you know, there was this pocket of sun. He went outside. He did what I said, basically. And about an hour and a half later, he called me and he said, I am blown away. He said, I, and I told him to just breathe, like inhale and exhale and really be conscious of your breath and just, you know, like no judgment, just like whatever is going on in his mind, just like let it go, but really get grounded. And he, he said, it was a miracle. I changed. I changed. I, I, it was bizarre. So, you know, there's so many things that people can do. I'm not saying that these might, might be the end all solutions, but boy, in a pinch, if you're like feeling super anxious or, or, you know, like do these things because they certainly can't hurt you or even walking around the block, you know, or going in your backyard. And if you don't want to walk, you know, like, I get some people are like, but there's like dog poop. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, well, don't step in the dog poop. <laughs> <laughs> but yes. anyway, if that bugs you, go sit on a bench and at least take your shoes off and have them grounded. And then there's 
you know, the other thing I worry about, and, and I have to be really careful in the winter here when they're, you know, you can't go grounding. I can't go walking <laughs> in the snow. I've tried it. It's a dumb idea. Oh, so no, it was really unple unpleasant <laughs> at best, but you know, you have to, you have to find, you have to find your solution. So I think life and finding your solutions to your mental health and your physical health, I think it's like this big adventure. Like we've been given this incredible body. We have, if we are 99% space and we're using only 1% of it, look at how much we have to discover and explore. There's so much out there that we get to be curious about. So for me, it's just like, wow. <laughs> I love that. It's like a game. I think of it that way too. Like, how can I optimize this meat suit that I'm traveling around in? You know, how do I, because <laughs> I'm just a spiritual being in this meat suit and I want to make the most out of it. It's so fun. Actually, I've had fun aging. I think aging has been, I didn't really think I was going to live past 25 for some weird reason. I just had it. I was hell bent that I wasn't going to make it. And so I took terrible care of myself those first 25 years. And now it's, it's so fun. And even when I get little age spots on my skin or whatnot, I'm like, that's cool. Like, it's cool what I'm, it's cool what I'm aging into. I try to age as intentionally as possible. And that's, I mean, I just really admire how much vitality you've carried with yourself all these years, because it's, that's it, right? At the end of the day, I look at people's vitality. I don't necessarily look at their meat suit. I'm looking at the glow coming off of them. And you see people in perfectly, you know, like very fit meat suits, but their vitality is very low. And conversely, you might see somebody who doesn't, maybe they're carrying some extra weight or whatever, but they are just glowing like the sun. Yeah. And so to me, it's like, yeah. how do we harness that vitality and how do we get that vitality to match the meat suit? So the meat suit can keep yeah. up with the goals. Yeah. Meat suit. <laughs> <You're funny. laughs> Tell me meat about, suit. you were telling me you went hiking. <laughs> Speaking of grounding though, I want to go back to that. Cause you said you went hiking. You said you went on a long hike barefoot. Is that correct? Yes. This morning, uh, there's a, a little hike at, well, it's not so little, it was long this morning. It's Bobby's birthday. So we hiked up with the dogs and yeah, we take our shoes off and it, it's a really, well, it's fall is coming. So it was really beautiful. You know, it's starting to get a little bit cold and you know, there's this, I don't know, it's just magical. And you change when you get that amount, it was, the sun was in our face. We went early, but the sun was in our face and we were walking barefoot and it just changes you at the end you're like mm, you know those things that you were worried about are like okay i can handle them but they're yeah like it's no big deal like what started out is like oh yeah i've got so much to do today. you know like whatever becomes like i got this that you know i mean yeah nature has a way of just like it, taking away the extraneous stuff that doesn't work I really, I really believe that. And I, and again, it, to me, that's where God lives, you know, in the breeze and the sound of the aspens that the aspens are making. And it was crazy. It was, yeah, I, but I just, I'm so into, <laughs> I'm I so love into it. nature. <laughs> I love it. And I love your Instagram and you show pictures of where you live and depending on the season, it looks so beautiful. So I, yeah, I'm with you. I personally didn't realize how much other people's energy impacted me until I moved out here in 2020. And I moved out here right at the start of the pandemic. I kind of got quarantined out here and stayed, but I don't hear everybody's noise anymore. And I'm such an empath and I can hear, yes. I can just, I can smell their fear, you know, and I can hear so much of it and living in an apartment building or in the city, I, or growing up actually in cul-de-sacs, I grew up in cul-de-sacs with people all around me. And now that I'm out here, I'm like, man, get me out wow. in nature and away from humans. Cause <laughs> I don't need all that noise, but you're right. When you go out in it and you're outside, it's, oh, I just, I want to take all these depressed kids and just throw them outside. And make I know. Well, and that's the thing we didn't have. I mean, I grew up, you had to go outside. Your parents yeah. like, Went see ya. Like, what are you doing in the house? You just were told, and you didn't show up until dinner time, maybe, you know, and there, and everybody was cool. Now, I get that we can't do that. I remember raising my kids thinking, gosh, it's so different. You know, everybody has to have a play date and I got to get them there. <laughs> I was like, whoa. But, 
you know, but that's why coming to Idaho was so great because during the summer they were able to walk around town by themselves, you know, once they were like 10 years old or whatever. And it's just kids don't go outside. They don't use their imagination. If they don't have a play date, if they don't have a game on there, if they don't have a movie to watch, if they, you know, like, and t- don't get me wrong, we wouldn't have th- be able to have this conversation if it weren't for the great technology that has come in the in the past, you know, 10 years. But it's also like, there's got to be moderation with that. You've got to be mindful, you know, like uh, Bobby and I turn our phones off at 8, 8, 8 p.m. It's like done. Sorry. I can't talk to you. You know, when he's out of town, it's like, good night. <laughs> well, let me call you really quick. <laughs> <laughs> We're about to hit the dot. No, I love that though. That's such a, these are such great. All, everything you're saying is just great reminders and great tips that I don't think a lot of people even consider, you know, they, it's kind of like right. the dietary stuff. They don't even consider it. And so these are, this is all really valuable. Um, how do you, how do your kids you know, cause it was the same for me. There was no just throwing them outside anymore. And I was like you, I just went out until the streetlights turned on and then I had to come home and eat or, you know, the dusk settled yeah. in and I had to get home in, by a certain time. But how do you, and this just, I don't even know how to ask the question. It's like, how do we even get some version of that for young people anymore? I don't know. I guess, I guess, you know, not everybody can move to the country, but maybe you plan things where you're you get your kids to where there is nature you know like for a while they were little I was making this show uh in New York City and we lived in an apartment in New York City we're really close to the park which is awesome but it's like I had to I got them into the park every single day but you know I had to go (laughs) I wasn't like go down the elevator see you later like it's a city it's a different world that we live in but I think you just have to you have to make that effort you have to realize that's important to a child it's important to their development it's important to get light like you need real light you need sunlight and this whole thing is like we we put pounds of chemical sunscreen on on our kids faces and bodies and on our own and you know like I know there's sun aging and all that stuff, but there are products out there that are not chemical and not detrimental to your health, but it's like kids need sunshine. They need air. They need to explore. They need to be bored. They need to get frustrated. They need to look for rocks. They need to do these things. You need to plan a trip to the beach where they can just walk barefoot in the sand. It's important. And I think we don't realize how important that is. And we've gotten so, oh, well, she's taking care of, she's in the corner, she's watching a movie or whatever. And like, you see like babies that can, I don't know how to work an iPad. I mean, like they're <laughs> like, whoa, whoa, you know, like I'm like, ah. Yeah, anyway, but that just shows my generation. <laughs> no, that concerns me when I see babies working iPads. I'm like, this is not. I know. I really agree with what you're saying. And it's, it's vital. And it's, did you always know this or was this something you've realized in the past? I don't know. Oh, I've always said, you like, I wouldn't, I was kind of mean as a mom. And then in retrospect, it was probably really stupid. I wouldn't let them watch television during the week. I mean, we didn't have, you know, it wasn't like you have Netflix or anything, but I, they were begging to watch television. I was like, okay, on the weekend, you can have two hours every day. But I think that that, incur you know my youngest daughter is a painter and you know those days on the when she couldn't watch television she painted the walls of her room right and that's you know that's when she became very interested in art and my other daughter is an is an actor and and she's also a model they have interests you know they read they're it's just so important we we forget the importance of the simple things. Like we grew up with books. They don't read, you know, they get a lot of information, but it's bits. It's like this, you know, it, you know, we were, we grew up with the MTV generation, but that's like, now everything's like zip, 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 zip. It's all quick, quick cuts and, you know, TikTok and not that I even know what that is, I don't <laughs> do it, but 
<laughs> people are like, do you do it? To, uh, uh, uh. Don't oh my do God, it. No, it's, I, I don't do I it either. Do, I can't even do it real correctly. So. <laughs> I know. Anyway, it's, I'm with you. I, you know, they say that the average person has the attention span of a goldfish. And I believe it at this point after, especially yeah. after seeing what went down with, with this pandemic, I'm just like, bring the common sense back, please. But no, I love this. You say the importance of simple things. And I think that's really, that's it, right? That's, yeah. And how cool of a story about your kids, because that's everything. What you sort of force them out of television and force them into, you didn't force them, but you, it forced yeah. them to bring their interests elsewhere. And which well, is- I pretty- also think that we don't give kids limits anymore. It's like, spend time with your kids and, or I don't know. I was kind of, I was a little disciplined you know, a little discipline crazy. It might've been a little too much. So, cause I didn't get any parenting really whatsoever. Like my parents were so wrapped up in my sisters and rightly so my sisters were a mess. Like my oldest sister has had and has schizophrenia and she was, you know, and they didn't, and that was back when nobody knew what that was. Like they thought she was a problem child of you know, the sixties having taken drugs, but really what it, what it did is it triggered a predisposition for all of this mental illness. And then my middle sister became a huge success, but she was an alcohol, massive alcoholic and taking drugs. So they were consumed. So I was kind of left to just raise myself. So I think I gave my kids a lot of maybe too much discipline. But I think kids need that. Like, I think they need to have limits. I think otherwise, it's like, why have parents? <laughs> you know, right. Like, just, all right, I would just throw you some food and say, no, you're there to give them boundaries. It's not to say yes to everything. And, and it's hard, you know, to be consistent as a parent is not easy. And I wasn't great all the time. I didn't make, <laughs> I didn't always make the right choices, but I think the parenting is, that's another thing. It's like, why don't, we don't know how to eat. We don't know how to parent and nobody tells us these things. Nobody mm-hmm. has to, like, why do we have courses in high school? Like we used to have home ec on how to, how to, you know, do basic things. People don't know how to do basic things. They know how to do incredible like technology things, but it's like, why aren't we taught about how to eat properly and that we should exercise, you know, like now we don't have gym in, in schools anymore. Yep. What? That's crazy to me. It's crazy. And I you know. want and and, 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 and yet we, and then we have like, you know, those machines with like fake food that comes out. It's like, what? Pizza and all the all the fast food comes out of a of a thing, so they never have to eat, you know. And probably that shit, that shitty food that we were getting at, at school lunches, it was probably better than what they're getting now. Oh, for sure. At least then it was probably food. It probably tasted gross. I was like, I told my mother, I was like, don't care. I mean, I was a very I, I was very lucky in a way. Bobby ate every fast food, everything when he was a kid. And I ate none because I grew up, there was no fast food. I have never, I have never to this day eaten a McDonald's hamburger. I have never, I've, I ate twice at an in and out burger. I think I ate their French fries once. I don't know. But I, I've never been to a fast food place ever. I was there once and I got a burger, but it came off a conveyor belt and the, the patty was like folded over because it came off wrong. I was like, well, that look, that's weird. I am not eating that. So I was lucky. I've never like, eat, I, I was never, I never got addicted to that part. And so I was lucky, you know? That's but amazing. Anyway, it that's, is amazing. That explains a lot. <laughs> <laughs> that's probably why you're so beautiful and healthy. That is, oh, you're so nice. That's crazy. That's crazy though. That's yeah, I mean, especially growing up in the world you grew up in. I mean, you would assume that that would be easy to access. So now this is fascinating. I'm so happy to have this conversation <laughs> with you. I truly, well, I, 
I always value anyone who's older than me who has sorted things out in a good way is I think of just such high value. You, you know, you were saying what we do to our elderly, but I think just even generationally respect for our elders and folks who are doing things right, especially people who are healthy. Um, I'm always, I'm, I'll walk down the street with my husband and I'll see somebody in their seventies and they're really healthy. And I'm like, what a handsome man, you know, it's not that I'm yeah. sexually interested but by any means. I'm just like, damn, like let's, we got to know what that's, what's going on there. That's <laughs> and living out it's here. True. Yeah. And like living out here with all these farmers, there's so many good looking, healthy, older farmers, men and women that are just, they're rugged. They yeah. know how to, you know, they know how to work with their hands. They've got skills. Yeah. They can can food. They're handy in an apocalypse. <laughs> so, where where are you in Oregon? I am in Amity, which is a tiny little town in wine country, just southwest of Portland. So I'm about an hour twenty minutes southwest of Portland. Out because on- my I used to go to I used to go to Salem every summer because my godparents lived in Salem, but they had a farm. And she would always take me, I, I always went to the Oregon State Fair with her because she had a big, you know, because she had the most amazing like orchards and this and she baked pies and she could sew. She was like so perfect. I was like, can you please be my mother? <laughs> <laughs> I want to be your child. That's I love amazing. Mother, but it, it was so cool. I was like, wow, this is so awesome. But that that's a very cool part of the world. I'm not sure if it's close, but I'm right by but, Salem. Yes. I am, oh, okay. Yeah. I am where you speak of. It's beautiful out here. And it's, yeah, it's just so, it's so, it was like, and they really knew she was like one of the first real, like organic farmers, like back in the day where nobody had to be organic, but she was, it was so, I mean, those gardens, I just spent hours. I spent all of August probably for seven summers uh there and I just loved it I just loved it she had tons of animals and chickens and goats and you know they all followed her around you thought she was like Miss Doolittle or something (laughs) I was gonna say she sounds like Dr. Doolittle oh I love it yeah it's a beautiful part of the world and the energy is really cool here it rains a lot that's the only problem but when we get summer like right now it's it's spectacular so yeah I just love this conversation I feel like I should let you go back to your sweetheart since it's his birthday so I don't want to keep you on Thank you, so, thank you so much for coming on and just sharing all of this, sharing your tips and uh, just your insight. It's incredibly valuable. And I hope people will take heart because we're lo- I feel like we're losing a lot of the sensibility of the world. And I'm glad to, that yeah. you're, you're holding it down in your part of the country. Oh, thank <laughs> you. Well, it's such a pleasure. It's a pleasure to finally actually talk to you. <laughs> oh, so sure. I, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled. And I, yeah. Anyway. And so everybody can tune into my, my podcast, which is tiny. <laughs> we just started. <laughs> no, it's exciting. I can't wait to be on. And this is great. Tell everybody yeah. where they can find you. So you're on Instagram. Uh, I'm on Instagram at Mariel Hemingway, uh, Mariel Hemingway official fan page on Facebook, which and by the way, just me, <laughs> nobody else does it. Um, so if you get a direct message back, it will be me. And then we, I just started, like literally we've done eight episodes of uh, a podcast for mental health because I just started a foundation called Mariel Hemingway Foundation, which is really for mental health, MarielHemingwayFoundation.org. And, And the podcast is called Outcomes the Sun. I wrote a book called Out Came the Sun. And this is called Outcomes the Sun. And it's with my uh, co-founder of the foundation, Melissa Yamaguchi. And we just, we talk to people like you and just about like how, what they're doing in the world to make a difference in mental health. Because people don't know, like when it comes to all of the anxiety and fears that have come up, especially for the last two years, People don't know what to do, don't know where to go, don't know how to start. And I just want people to realize it's like all the choices they make, but also talking to experts like yourself, talking to neuroscientists. And then sometimes Melissa and I just talk about things like what's going on in the world and kind of our view and take on it. And it's only a half an hour long. So if you you won't get bored, it's like, bam, done. (laughs) 
<laughs> I love it. No, so important. That's great. I will make sure that all of the links are in the show notes for this episode so people can find you and find your foundation. That's good work. Thank you're you doing. so much. Yes. And thank you again for coming on the Dr. Tina show. And I'm so happy to finally meet you. I'm so happy to, to be able to do this. Thank you.